Before I get started, I want to acknowledge that the work that you are going to see next is not mine anymore. There is a lot of people that had work on uh, making all of this uh, data possible, including my own family that I had actually made to work on, on this stuff. <laughs> uh, some uh, postdocs, students, tens of students, and now hundreds of volunteers. The work that uh, I'm going to that I have been working on over the last 20 years is trying to understand the feedbacks of us as humans impacting nature, right? So we always are concerned about a species going extinct. My question is, what are the consequences of that for people? And after 20 years of work, working on this, we had about 54 publications in my, in my lab, including a book and stuff like that. I had come out to understand that all of that work can be summarized on this simple equation here, which is that the health of an ecosystem is equal to the inverse of people times consumption. Basically, the more people you put in an ecosystem and the more they eat, the worse the ecosystem is going to look like. Of course, the alternative title to this is we are screwed. <laughs> and the reason why I said this, and you will see some of the results why I get to this conclusion, is the fact that humanity, we are pushing the boundaries of nature beyond these tipping points in which it's going to take a long time for nature to, re to, to recover from that. But let's get down to business, to what I wanted to talk to you today. So climate change is defined by, by many as a Okay, this is not working for some reason. Climate change is defined by, by many as a game changer. Basically, what is happening is that we are producing greenhouse gases like nobody's business. And I think that that's a, a fair statement when you see the amount of uh, activities that we do every single day that produce carbon. Now, the other component of climate change is that we are destroying ecosystems. Basically what is happening is that these ecosystems are supposed to be taking the carbon from the atmosphere and we are destroying them. Here you can see basically the, what is happening here is the destruction of ecosystems that are supposed to be sequestering carbon. This is our planet about 5,000 years ago and you can see that it was green everywhere and as humanity started spreading everywhere we went we start destroying nature. We started in India, I believe that was the affair of the Kama Sutra right there. Then we moved to Asia, and that was Genghis Khan, I believe, that had over 6,000 kids. And the, the, the main point here is that everywhere we went, we destroyed nature. As it was shown early on, on the oceans alone, over 80% of the surface of the ocean is already impacted by human activities. Today on land, we have already destroyed 80% of the surface of our planet single species having such a massive footprint on the planet. Now, of course, if you produce carbon, and what can take the carbon out of the atmosphere is being destroyed, the cumulative effect of that, of course, is then that the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere is going to go up. No surprise, the instruments that are measuring carbon are demonstrating that the CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing to the point that last year, the levels were 400 parts per million, which is the highest it has been in the last 3.5 million years. In the last 3.5 million years, we had never seen levels of CO2 as, the high, as high as the ones we saw last year. All of it, the consequence of us. Now, the laws of physics are very clear that with these increases in CO2, you are gonna increase the temperature of the planet. There are gonna be ramifications associated with patterns on rainfall the sea level is going to go up, mostly because the, the glaciers are going to be melting, um, but also because of the thermal expansion of the water. The ocean pH is going to go down, and many other climatic changes will be associated with this increase on greenhouse gases. Now, it turns out that as a consequence, species are going to be impacted as well. Species, they are adapted to live on the places where they are. As soon as you change their climate, of course, then you are going to put these species to deal with one or three choices, right? One is to move, the other one is try to adapt, and if they can do neither one of those, then they go extinct. There are also consequences at the human level. 
disasters, hurricanes, typhoons, uh, and uh, spread of diseases and things like that. These are also some of the direct consequences of these climate changes on uh, humanity as well. There is a, an indirect effect of climate change on people that is mediated by the capacity of ecosystems to produce food to people, right? And this thing that you just see here is pretty much the entire ramifications of climate change. Unfortunately, getting this kind of understanding is very, very complicated. The reason is this. Here, you had the climate scientists. Here, you had the ecologists. And here, you had the social scientists. And unfortunately, these people don't like each other. You put these people in a room, and they will start fighting within 30 minutes. Give them an hour if you give them alcohol at the beginning of the presentation. Why these people don't like each other? Well, because they are talking different languages here. These people try to model everything. They want everything to be part of a mathematical equation that is a function of an action and a reaction. Here we had the ecologists. Um, we had models, but we also have now some very good empirical data. We give ourselves a 5% chance that we are wrong. And now you had the social scientists here, which had the less credibility of all of the three there. Most people refer to them as hippies because they spend a lot of time hanging out in these villages and smoking who knows what. <laughs> but the problem for these guys here, though, is that they had the hardest jobs of all. Which is, which is to try to make sense of human behavior. Uh, and now imagine trying to put all of this kind of stuff into a single paper. So what you are going to see next is some of the examples of big data analysis in which we are trying to articulate data from all of these disciplines into very unique papers. Let's get started here on the ocean. The climate modelers are telling us that the oceans are going to get warmer, the, o the oxygen is going to reduce, the pH is going to go down, making the oceans more acidic, and the oceans are also going to reduce the capacity to produce food. This is what the, what the climate scientists are telling us. Now, the ecologists look at these maps and they realize very quickly that there is just nowhere in the world where you can hide from these changes. So as an ecosystem or as a species, you will have to deal simultaneously with all of these changes at the same time. This is like me or you getting into a fight with Mike Tyson, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, and Chucky Chang. <laughs> there is just no way we are going to survive a fight with those four guys. This is exactly what we are exposing these species to. In a scenario in which there is just no way they will have the capacity or the capabilities to overcome these challenges. Now, as for humans, it turns out that today, around the coastal areas of all of these countries where changes are going to be massive, we had 870 million people that are vulnerable to these changes. This is people whose entire livelihoods, we are talking about food, jobs, and revenue, depend from things that they take from the ocean. To make matters even worse, these people is poor. So let's talk about people being screwed, right? These people is gonna be heavily impacted, losing jobs and food, and to make matters worse, they had no money to withstand or to adapt to these changes. Now let's get out of the water and look at what's going to happen on land. This is a project in which we were looking just at plants, and we look at the several climatic variables that influence the capacity of a plant to grow. Right? So for instance, if you look at temperature, there are temperatures that are too cold, and the plant will die or not grow, and there are some temperatures that are perhaps too hot, and the plant will not grow there either. So basically, we had these thresholds, and what we wanted to do was to count the number of days in a year that we in those thresholds. Basically, we came out with this new index that is called the suitable plant growing season, which is the number of days in a year with su suitable climates for a species to grow. What you are going to see next is the difference between today and the year 2100. The scale here goes between red, being places that are going to be losing days, up to 300 days, and in blue, places that are going to be gaining days, right? Here you can see the results of that paper. Most tropical places around the world, including Indonesia and Philippines, are going to be losing close to 300 days. I mean, you don't need to be a farmer to understand the challenge that it will be for you to grow anything when 300 days of the year are unsuitable for you to grow anything in there. Right? Now, it turns out, though, 
that some places will benefit from climate change. When I saw this map for the first time on my computer there, I was just thinking about the political implications of this. And one thing that occurred to me is this. The changes where climate change is going to have a positive effect are at higher latitudes. The reason for that, of course, is those places today are very cold, and as the planet heats up, many days are going to become suit suitable. Of course, that's going to happen within reason because those places are still limited by the amount of light that they get there. Right? Nevertheless, there are some places that will benefit from that. Those places are mostly located in Canada, Russia, and China. For me, that was something that I was very worried about because I thought that for the Americans, we need to start making better friendships with the Canadians because the alternative is for us to deal with the Russians and the Chinese to get our food. Right? And it, this is no joke. Imagine the political leverage that you will give to some countries when the capacity to feed the rest of the world relies on their hands. And of all of places, is China and Russia. So maybe we need to elect Donald Trump, since he's the one that has the better relationships with Russia, I suppose. <laughs> now, as for the people, today, on all of these places where climates are going to be unsuitable for the plants, we have 2.3 billion people whose entire livelihoods depend on things that are going to be impacted by climate change, and unfortunately, they are poor. This is the amount of people that will be vulnerable to changes just on agricultural production to, due to climate change. Now, up to this moment, what we have seen are the indirect impacts of climate change on people, mediated by changes on goods and services that we take from nature. But what about more direct impacts on climate change? So I got interested in this question of, can climate change kill you, right? And one of the ideas that occurred to me is this new project that is called the Little Heatway Project. Here, we have different climatic variables that influence a process that is called hyperthermia. Basically, hyperthermia is when the amount of heat in your body increases beyond an optimum temperature. As soon as that happens, several processes get activated into the human body that impair the functionality of several organs that then are capable of causing death. Right? So the physiology is very clear to suggest that people can die when it gets very hot. How common is this? So I invite you to go to, to Google and type little heat waves. Right? And what you ended up finding is this. This heat wave in Pakistan killed 1,000 people. This one in California killed a few people. This one in India, 2002. This one in Paris, 2016, 3,000 people were killed. This one in France, 2015, 700 people died. This one in Europe, this is the big one. This heat wave killed 35,000 people in just two weeks. Huh? Isn't that insanity? This is like a September 11 attack every day for two straight weeks. Huh? 35,000 people. In Paris alone, that heat wave killed 14,000 people. We have one in Russia, killed 15,000 people. The United States, 2012. San Luis, 1993. Just last week, one in El Paso killed four people. So my students and I decided to investigate how common is this. And what we found is that around the world, since 1980, we had 2,000 records in the literature when people had died when it got to be very hot. So from this data, we obtained the time and the place we know, of course, and we took all of the climatic conditions of those cities on those dates, just to find out what was so strange about the climate of those places that killed so many people. And then we had this very good model that now can tell you whether a heat wave is capable of killing people or not. And then we applied that model to go global projections. So these are the global projections of heat waves by the year 2100. As you can see, most of the heat waves that are capable of killing people will happen at mid-latitudes. We will have on the order of up to eight heat waves in some places like Australia, South Africa, um, Uruguay, and Brazil there. And as for the cumulative number of days of these heat waves, some of those places will have up to 150 days that are capable of killing a human being. We're talking that places like Australia, I think that you are better, I don't know what you guys are going to be doing there, but for almost the entire summer, it will be dangerous to go outside. Huh? Now, I want to take a quick break here, though, to acknowledge that many of these papers that you have seen here have been done as part of a course that I teach at the University of Hawaii called Methods for Macroecology. 
And the idea of that class is that I try to teach students how to do this big scale analysis. The class of 2012, they published their paper in Nature, and it was published as a research article. That paper was highlighted in the Washington Post, New York Times, we were on CNN front page for two straight weeks. A day, sorry. And I had to tell you this because at that moment of my life, I felt like I was at the peak of my career because from, from there on, everything looked just downhill. Now, the class of 2013, we published the paper in the journal Plus Biology. The class of 2014 and 2015, we just had our paper in Review in Nature, which is this one of the little heat waves. And the reason why I wanted to point this out is because many of you are just like me in the sense that it's very hard to get money to do stuff, right? And we had to fulfill multiple requirements as a professor, including teaching, getting publications, and why not? And I think that this approach is a win to win. The students get training, they are paying you to get them training. On top of that, the students get a paper. As a professor, you get a paper as well. You get excellent reviews. My students now rank me on the top 99% of the best professors at the university thanks to this stuff. And more importantly, you get a lot of free labor. Today, being so hard to secure money to do anything, if we can focus all of these efforts into a specific project, then we are actually fulfilling a lot of requirements that don't cost money at all. This day, this approach is working so good for me that I just show up in my in the lab with a case of beer, get my drink while my students do the work. <laughs> now, how much time is left? For, this is another paper. This is the one that got published in Nature in which we introduce a new index that is called the year of climate departure. Let's look at the index for Hawaii. So this is the temperature variability for Hawaii in the last 200 years. From there, we took the minimum and maximum temperature and then we look at our models to calculate the year after which temperature moves beyond that threshold. That year, according to this one model, is the year 2029, which is the year of climate departure for the state of Hawaii, right? We did it now, we do this now globally. In red, you are gonna see places that are gonna change pretty soon, in blue, in, later into the century. The global average is the year 2047, plus or minus an error of 14 years given uh, the variability among the models. We are talking that by the middle of this century, the temperature of the planet is gonna move to something that we had never seen before. As for people, chances are that between one and five billion people are gonna be living in places by 2050 that will be facing completely no novel climates. Now, there are multiple implications on this paper, but one of the ones that I wanna point out is this one about the fact that we will live to see this. One thing that you hear often about people re talking about climate change is that this is a legacy that we are leaving to our children and to our grandchildren. First of all, I find that remark despicable because how is it that we even say that stuff? What kind of parents are we to leave that mess to our children? But more importantly, it's not even true. 2047 is 33 years into the future, right? So this is me at age 40, in 33 years, I'm gonna be 72. <laughs> so, sorry to break it to you, but this isn't a legacy to your children. This is a legacy to yourself into the future. You guys and myself, we're gonna live to see this. Sorry for the elderly here, I, think, I don't think you will see this. <laughs> now, let's combine all of these papers together just to give you a picture of how bad this is. When you look at the heat waves, you find that the heat waves are happening at mid-latitudes. When you look at the absolute change in temperature, you see that the largest changes will happen at the poles. And when you look at the year of climate departure, the largest changes will happen in the tropics. So you overlay these things together, the conclusion of this is that there will be no place where you can hide from this stuff. Now, as I told you earlier, Climate change has two components to it. One is us producing emissions, and the other one is us destroying habitat. Basically, what is happening is this massive transformation of terrestrial and marine ecosystems to look, things that look like this. These habitats, this transformation, are the habitats of many species. So this is the double wank that I was talking about in the sense that these species, we're destroying their habitats, and to make things even more exciting for them, we are also changing their climates. 
right? Of course, the consequence of this is then that we will have extinction. And extinction is something that is happening. And now I want to take just one minute, one minute, to look at the faces of the species that we have driven to extinction. Can you raise the volume, please? I mean, I don't know you guys, but I find this super depressing. This is a testament to human selfishness. How is it that all of these species are going extinct on their or watch? Not only that, we are the ones causing the extinction of these species. All of the species that you saw there were driven to extinction in the place where I live right now in Hawaii. But around the world, every year, we are driving to extinction 20,000 of these guys, 20,000 of them. Uh, and it has been demonstrated scientifically, so you don't think it's me exaggerating stuff. You can go and check it out in a science. 20,000 species. You have to ask the question, did we lose our humanity? When did we become so detached of this stuff? Now, as a scientist, I can continue doing this stuff and depressing the crap out of people, or I can start trying to do research, trying to figure out the solutions. Right? And I decided to do that a few years ago, and I had to tell you, I'm going to summarize some papers that we have published already, some of the solutions. The first solution, in my opinion, is we need to reduce natality. This is going to get me in trouble with a lot of people here, but that's the reality of the stuff. I'm going to show, you, show, it that, show that to you mathematically. This planet got to be too small for so many people. Now, let me use myself as a case example. This is me. Right now, maintaining my body, the amount of calories that I eat every day, requires the productivity of 2.1 hectares. Right now, the food that I eat, all the things that I do, require the productivity of 2.1 hectares. Keep in mind, given that I do this stuff, I try to be environmentally friendly. I screw up sometimes, I eat steak and why not? But nevertheless, I still produce 2.1 hectares of a land that I require. Now, multiply that by 7 to 7.2 billion people, divide that by the Earth's biocapacity, which is estimated at 11 billion hectares, what you ended up is that in the year 2014, when these papers were published, humanity was consuming 1.3 planet Earths. We were consuming the productivity of 1.3 planet Earths, 30% more than what the planet can produce sustainably. Now, when you look at this equation, what are the solutions? One of them, and the IPCC will tell you to fix climate change, we, what you need to do is to reduce consumption. And I have to tell you that that's not even right. Why not? Well, because there is already way too many people that even if you reduce this consumption, you are still going to have more hectares than what the hectares are available. Of course, you should try to reduce this huge disparity among the amount of food that people eat, but that's not going to fix your problem. Now. The other solution here is maybe technology, which is to increase the capacity of the planet to produce food. Fair enough, GMOs maybe will come and save us, but what we need to realize from this is the environmental impacts of these technologies as well. And in my view, right now, given what we had, this is the big elephant in the room. Here you can see the IUCN, the United Nations projections on the number of people by the year 2050. I multiplied that by 2.1 hectares. I wanted every single human being to have the kind of life that I had. Divide that by the Earth's biocapacity. 
And then I calculated the number of planets, the number of planets required for humanity at the year 2050. So we are talking that by the year 2050, we will need a 27 planet Earths to feed the population there. So I back calculated a scenario to become sustainable, and then I back calculated the number of people, and that scenario is possible with one child per person. We can discuss that later on the, down the road. Now, the other solution that I want to point out is that we need to become carbon neutral. Even in the best case scenario, I'm going to be producing carbon. How do we get rid of that carbon? Basically, a situation in which the carbon that I produce is equal to the carbon that is removed by ecosystems. The question is, how do we do this? So I started a project called the Carbon Neutrality Project. It's a web page. It will be live maybe in a few weeks. You go there, you calculate your emissions. We had all of the mathematical equations to tell you how much carbon certain trees will sequester. You calculate the deficit, and then given the average product, the sequestration of your trees, it will tell you how many more trees you need to plant to become carbon neutral. At any moment, you will be reminded of how much carbon is left there. But because we can calculate this carbon deficit, which is how far you are from becoming carbon neutral, then we can compare that among all of the people that participate on the project. So at any moment, this is me here, I can see how far away I am from the person that is most, the most carbon neutral in the whole project. And I, any time I'm being told how many more trees I need to go and plant to, to beat that person. And we are going to see if we can give rewards to the people or not. Now, unfortunately, that's not as easy as it sounds. The first problem is that 90% of the trees that are planted by the state die. The key reason for why the plants die is water. So my lab these days, this is not viable. For a person to go and water these trees every day is just not viable. So my lab now is developing a microcomputer that is plugged into the soil and is monitoring the amount of water that is in the soil. When it gets very dry, then it turns on a water pump that put water into your tree. Right? This device is being produced for about $15. Now the cost, we have managed to reduce it to about $5. And all what you have to do is to go and fill up that bucket of water. That bucket of water lasts for about two months for a single tree. We want to plug this to the internet so that you get reminders of how full the bucket is. So when the bucket is at 50% full, you get an email saying, hey, the bucket is at 50%. Please bring me water. If you don't go and the bucket keeps going down, then you get another reminder at a 15%. Hey, dude, you forgot to bring me water. I seriously need water. And if you don't go, the bucket gets empty and the tree dies, then you get an email saying, hey, you killed me, you bastard. <laughs> now, the other challenge that we faced with this project was the weeds. You Some of our trees were planted here, and all of this was clean, and this is about two months after our places were abandoned. So all trees get pretty much eaten alive by weeds. So my lab now is developing new technologies to see if we can get rid of these weeds easier. And this is a machine that is trying to pull out some invasive trees that is being operated by my daughter, actually. And we were just trying to demonstrate that pulling these big trees is actually something feasible even for a child. This is a, a new design that we are developing here, trying to get rid of the smaller trees, hopefully by strong people, so that we can clean up these areas sooner. Who will do this work? Right now we are working with school children, trying to see if we can maybe get their parents planting the trees. So to do this project, I went and of course explained climate change to the kids. So this is me giving a lecture on climate change. You can see the, a figure here from the IPCC report to these children there. I pretty much was boring the crap out of these kids after slide two. <laughs> you can see their faces there. Look at their hands. I mean, they were about to fall asleep. So that kind of forced me to figure out an alternative way to teach this, which we are actually trying to develop in self. But right away, we implemented a new method in which actually the kids are the ones explaining the science to us. And it's amazing because these kids know very well already the whole chavango of what's happening to our planet. Then we get them excited. We plant our trees. And this is, for instance, one girl planting her tree, deploying her watering device. This is another example here, the watering device here, the tree there. And this is a, a, a common example when we go in these uh, weekend activities to plant trees there. Now, I, I have three more minutes. I'm just going to use two more slides to contextualize the magnitude of the problem that we had at hand. When you look at the universe, the entire universe, it turns out that we know that there are 100 billion planets, 10 of which meet the characteristics of our planet. 
That means that the probability of us finding another planet like this is one in one billion. This is sweet home, sweet home. There is nothing else like this planet. The probability of us finding another planet is one in one billion. I want to contextualize this number for you. Has anyone won the national lottery here once? Nobody? Okay, good. Actually, on one presentation, a person said that she won the national lottery, and it totally ruined my analogy. <laughs> it turns out that winning the national lottery has a probability of one in 200 million. One in one billion is like winning the national lottery five times in a row. Yeah? You, you don't know a single person that has won the national lottery once. What are the odds that we're going to find a person that will win the national lottery five times? So the end point of this presentation here is that if we damage this planet, we are stuck in here. All of us. You can be Bill Gates, a billionaire. If we damage this planet, you are in here just like everybody else. Now, another thing that I want to point out is that we keep delaying solutions, right? Because somehow we think that magically something is going to come and save us. So I was invited to give a presentation to a church. And after I gave my presentation, the priest came to me and he said, your presentation is very depressing. <laughs> but you know what? God will provide. And then, I am pretty slow thinking. It takes me a while to figure out stuff, but then I was just, I was very disappointed by that remark. So this is what I decided to do, and what I show now. So I went to the internet and looked for civilizations that had disappeared, right? All of these civilizations had disappeared, and the only reason why we know they existed is because they left all of these monuments. Guess what? These people built these monuments, playing to the gods for help. So this notion of us expecting that God will save us is not something unique to us. People have tried that in the past. And guess what? People, God didn't help them. These people pray until they went extinct, and God did not help them. These people destroy their capacity of local ecosystems to produce basic things like food and water, and as a result, they went extinct. Now, I'm putting myself in the position of God, and I think, why am I going to help this guy? I mean, I make him good-looking, intelligent. I put him on this planet. What he does, he goes and destroys the whole thing. No, I don't think God is going to help us. If anything, I think that God is just going to be peace at us. Now, this is my last remark, and I'm going to tell you something very personal that is driving me these days, and it's this. One day, I'm going to die, right? I'm going to be there standing in the doors of heaven. God is going to be on that side, and he's going to ask me, hey, what did you do that you think you deserve to come in here? And I'm going to tell God, God, you know what? You gave me intelligence, and I tried to do the best I could. I did a project called the Carbon Neutrality Project, and I tried to plant as many trees as possible to fix the mess that we were doing. And I'm hoping that God will say, you know what? You are welcome. Come on in. Now, what I want you to do, though, and I want you to do this, is what will you answer to God once you are the one standing in front of him? Today, I don't think saying to God, God, I was very good. Sorry, but I don't think that's going to cut it. So this thing I promise you, I will put a very, work, very good work with him if you join my project. <laughs> with that, I want to thank you and have a good day.